Hello everyone, welcome to the 37th webinar in 12D's training webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator here at 12D Solutions. 12D's training webinars showcase common industry challenges, taking a close look at industry best practices and how these can be implemented using 12D products. The aim of these webinars is to upskill 12D users and broaden their understanding of the capabilities of 12D products. We run these webinars regularly and record them for posting through our website and on YouTube. The previous 36 webinars from this training series, as well as the webinars from our Industry Solutions series, are available on our YouTube channels if you missed those. During this live presentation, you'll be able to type your questions along the way, as shown on the screen, and we'll answer as many as possible throughout the webinar. Today's webinar 12D Model Design Absolute Basics will be presented by Graham Winfield, who has over 20 years of experience in the industry as a civil designer on projects including motorways, highways, tunnels, airfields, mining, dams and rail. In today's webinar, we'll look at the overview of 12D file and folder structures, the design process, survey data, creating designs, creating outputs, resolving 12D model startup problems, and where to get more information. Over to you, Graham. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everyone. To start with, how are the 12D model files and folders organized? The 12D model software is installed to the program files area of your computer. There are two possible locations, depending on the 32 or 64-bit platform of 12D model and the operating system. 12D provides included setup and library folders here. Do not modify any files under program files. Copy them to the user location first. Any future updates will be replace all files and folders in this location. There is an option when installing 12D model to include the training data. This data is used when doing the getting started tutorials and is located for version 12 in the C 12D 12.00 folder. This is separate to the program files location and will not be replaced with the new install. 12D has a place to store custom setup files and library files. So in C12D 12.00 user and user lib. User has files that are read when the 12D starts. User lib has files that are referenced while using 12D. The job folder is where all files and are stored for the job. This structure will suit your organization's standard job folders and can be anywhere on the hard disk or network. As each 12D project worked on, we have many input output files with similar or even the same name. It is strongly recommended that you keep each project in a separate subfolder called the, the 12D working folder. Have a working folder for each 12D project you have. The 12D project folder is where all the project files are kept and they should only be accessed from 12D model. Always zip up both the working and project folders when transmitting projects to others. Also be aware if there are any shared in projects as these projects may need to be provided as a separate zip file as well. Today when talking about design, I'm generally referring to modeling of earthworks and materials for rail road, airfields and dam projects, not the design of flooding, flood modelling, drainage and other services. But no matter what area of design you are doing, they all follow a similar design process. It is important to have a survey brief that suits the design required. Then when the survey is available, does it meet the brief? Are there any problems with the data? When planning the job, consider naming conventions will be used what commands or options will be used and what inputs they need. How many will work on the job at a time? Do you need to share data between 12D projects? The first design task is to set up the project controls. Then from that the design strings, surfaces and 3D objects can be created. When the design is complete or at a point for review, Output the drawings, reports and quantities. All of this process may need to be repeated or just part of it as the job develops. 
So what survey data do you need? The best scenario is to get all of the four following items. Points and lines form the existing surface and many other non-surface information like underground services. The triangulation is important to receive. This way the surveyor is providing the existing surface and designer is not generating it based on assumptions. The surveyor's plots provide confirmation of what the surveyor has provided and may have extra information that could be missed. The surveyor's custom colours, line styles, symbols as 12D files will help the designer view the data in 12D just as the surveyor has. This will help visualise uh, to see the various survey features. But if 12D data is not available, there are many alternative input methods. The common ones are listed here. Now let's have a look at some of the, these steps using 12D model. So here I have a, um, a project with some survey. The, um, the survey is made up of several models <coughs> and a tin. The tin was not provided by the surveyor, so we need to review just what it looks like. View controls here are handy to um, position views on the screen. The top section is for positioning the view into a left half, right half, bottom right corner and so on. The second half of this, this panel is more used for the uh, people using tablets where you can resize, expand the view, you can shrink the view, make it smaller and you can move the view around. So that's doing those sort of things. I'm going to put this, this view into the left half. And so we'll have a look at the tin, see what it's about. Edit the tin. All right, we'll select the uh, survey. I'll just explain a little bit about the triangulation tin. As you, you may not all be aware of what all these um, settings here do. Preserve strings uses the string segment as break lines when forming triangles. Otherwise, only points are used. Remove bubbles helps minimise flat triangles when triangulating contour data. We tin reduces tin size by removing duplicate points. Triangle data is for triangulating data that is triangles. Sometimes people output things with other software and we all we get is triangles. It's not a tin, it's just triangle data, strings in triangles. So that's what that's referring to. Cell method is an alternative method for uniform data in lines and grids. And colour by triangle data is using that triangle data's, data's colour to colour the tin. So those two work together. So you can see that we're preserving strings and we're getting rid of any duplicate points. We don't need any of the other options there. So here's the models that the um, triangulation is made up of. And we've got some nulling here to remove the uh, long triangles around the outside of the, the triangulation. So the tin can be displayed in the view by various means. On the properties panel, under the tin settings, there is draw edges. That's used when you have things like the contours or the flow arrows on and you want to also see the edges. There's tin solid and that's good to see the exact extent, extents of the tin and whether it's got any holes inside it. When you're using the tin solid and if the tin is displayed last, you can't see any of the other data. So what we can do is there's a command here under view send tin rasters to back. And so now we can see the data on top of that tin. 
for the knowing at the moment we're getting rid of those long triangles if I uh, duplicate this panel just because I'm, I'm lazy and I don't want to uh, have to type all this stuff out again I'll just clear all this information here and retriangulate so what you can see is now we've got these smooth edges along the edge there and what that means when we toggle off the um, another way to do that toggle off the solid is through the, the quick toggles we can see down here we've got some long triangles around the edges so when we retriangulate they're removed they can give um, wrong information about the edges all right so another setting that we've got here is the contours and so the contours um, uh, a quick way of seeing what the the surface looks like as 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 per contours it's just another uh, display method within the, the plan view but what I've noticed here is where these strings are the contours seem to go a bit crazy and it looks like the trees probably don't um, probably don't need to be triangulated so we'll go into this data and we'll remove the, the vegetation model and retriangulate that and so that's given us better better result So now that we're happy with the, the survey, we'll move on and do a, um, a tennis court pad. So here's the um, location that the, the client has asked us to put the, the tennis um, court. And so we need to do a pad to, uh, to level the ground there. Using the model string info table, we can see all the information that's in the model. Doing a middle mouse button pick in the, um, the model box, do the same as we can pick the, the string and go update. So we can see that this model has got one string on it and it's a super string. It also has the other information there. We do a string inquire so under strings inquire or f2 we can pick this and we can see that that is a super string and it is closed in the middle of that panel has closed yes so what I want to do is I want to make a super alignment for this pad under utilities A to G convert there's convert to super alignment we know that it's just the one string and um, the super alignment has two two ways that information can be created there's the IP method and the element method the IP method is simple but it also can be more work when redesign is needed whereas the elephant element method is um, a lot more friendly when modifying and also has a lot more power in um, doing um, alignments and referencing each other i'm going to make it the element method now i just need to give it a model alignment pad create so what we've done there we've now created a model called alignment pad I'll add that on and remove the old string so we can um, see what what this looks like I'll position the um, section view the bottom bottom right and we'll profile our alignment string so what we can see here is that the 
level of the alignment is down probably at lay, um, RL0 and we want to move it up into the, the area where our tin is. To help us see what's happening on the, um, the section view, we can quickly just toggle on the grid. And so we can see that we, as a starting point, probably RL30 is a good height for this um, tin. So on the uh, super alignment toolbar, we'll edit the string. This picked it. Okay, so pick the string and go to the elements, the path editor. So we can see here all the horizontal elements, which we're happy with. And here's the vertical. The vertical is using a fixed line and using two points. So two points means we need to enter the, the height using two, two, um, two um, values. Another way we can do that is do a fixed line point and grade. This way we only need to enter in one point. And because it's a closed string and it's level, we only need this one point and it will be all sorted. So if we type in here 30 and go set, we now have a pad level at RL30. You can go extents and there's our, our pad. So that's now our pad, but we need to know what earthworks and what um, extent of earthworks will happen and, and what the volumes are. So under design, apply, there's a nice little function here called interface. We'll call this one pad and we'll pick our string. And what I've just noticed, when I track along in uh, the section view, it, it shows you where you are in plan. And I've noticed that this is a string that's going anti-clockwise. And I'd like it to be in a clockwise direction. So we will need to reverse the string. When you're unsure of where commands might be, there is the search toolbar. You can type in reverse and it will fill out all the options that have for reversing. So there's the CAD string reverse, there's the strings edit reverse, and there's a super alignment tools reverse. Super alignment have um, their own commands because they are complex strings and, and need to be dealt with differently to just general um, other strings. So we'll pick this one here. So we'll pick our string. Geometry only is for more complex super alignments that are using computators. As this is just a straight convert from a super string, we won't tick that button. So just watch the section view when I hit the reverse. You'll notice that the tin is updated based on now, the string going in the reverse location in a clockwise direction. So back to the panel, we've got here the start and end change. We're going to do the full extents of the string. We've got our cut and fill slopes, our section separation. I'll just make that one. The search dis distance is how far it's going to look before it stops looking for the tin. If, it, if a interface um, slope value doesn't reach the tin. And we're going to apply this interface function to the left of the string. I'll select the uh, tin survey and give it some names for the data we're creating. Design pad and cross section pad interface. So what we've done is we've created some models but they haven't shown up anywhere. We can go to the plus and add them. Or another method we can use is to go comma, pad, and that's the view name. And do that for both of those. Comma, 
pad and that when the, the model is created it's also added to the view and that can save us having to go to different um, views and add data as we, as we uh, create it. I'm going to leave the panel there um, I'll come back to that one and what we'll do we'll create a tin of our pad so what we're going to do we're going to call this one pad press enter I'm going to copy the model name to be the function name another little thing we can do to, to find colors easy and models is when we type in viz space d go control d it'll fill out and give us all the options for models starting or colors starting with viz d I'm going to go with dirt 3 I'm going to weed the tin and not having any other, any other methods so the data I'll just go with the data on the pad view and nulling I'm going to make the length one because there's a string all the way around the outside so it'll suck it all into to the extent of that that tin triangulate now let's add our tin onto the view with this panel here we can type in some things and it'll give us all the op options that have the tin so there's our tin we'll go view send tins to back and so now we've got our data on top of the tin we can also have a look at our tin in the perspective view one simple way to get all this data across is view models transfer we just pick our plan view pick our perspective view and there's our our data all there all right so I'm not really happy with having one and one cuts I'm going to make it one and four and the fill slope I'm going to make it one and six I'm going to go interface and so now we can see where the batters are based on those slope values where it is fill is green and where it is cut it is red but the tin didn't update so I'll need to update that separately if we're doing a lot of this repetitive um, modifying our design we can make up chains to do this process to save time I won't look at that today another thing we can do we can change the value of the, um, the height of the string let's have a look and see what value 25 does okay set so we can see that in this view here the the alignment has now dropped down down below where we were we can simply go re-triangulate uh, re-interface our design and re-triangulate our tin and there we're all updated again but obviously having this tennis court in a big basin is not a good idea for drainage so probably back where we were was a, is a better better option set you can see the uh, model is updated back in here our model is updated in the plan view but let's update now back to where we were and re-triangulate that and it's also update that because all the various views are just looking at the data via different means plan from from above and perspective as per how we decided to view the view the information all right so uh, now we'll move on to do some uh, simple simple snaps um, so using the the snaps and measures we're going to lay out uh, a control line through our subdivision so we'll create a an alignment from the alignment toolbar so we'll go to our naming convention we'll go to alignment select a reference string we'll give it a unique name we'll call it 01 I want to label the string by 
design plan left hand side and I'll go a major interval of 50. That's all I'll need to do here. So I'll go create. All right, let's have a look at what we need to do. So I'll insert a part for the horizontal. So the first IP section, that's for all the IPs. The rest is for all the uh, element method. I'm going to go with the two points and create the straight down the center of this road reserve. One simple way to do this is use the same as. By using um, directional picking, I can pick, drag, release and select that road reserve boundary. Go accept that. It's filled in some coordinates for me. If I go set on that, it's now created the first segment based on that um, string that I selected in the same as. It's made it exactly where it was, but we need to get that into the middle of the road reserve. So there is this offset set option here and the measures. So what we're going to do is use the string to point and find out how wide this road reserve is. So down in the message area, it says what we're, we need to do. It says select string. So I'm going to pick the string where we are currently got the alignment. It can be either the alignment or it can be the um, proposed boundary. Accept that. And so now wherever I move the mouse, it tracks perpendicular to that string and it's asking me for a point. So I'll just pick the corner of this boundary and go accept. You can see that it's punched in here 20. So 20 is the road reserve width, but we want to be half the width. So I'll just start type in divide by two and go enter. And so now we've got 10. But similar to the picking with direction to determine which way the string goes, the offset is left and right positive to the right and negative to the left. So as we're offsetting to the left, we'll make this a negative value. Go set. So now we can see we've got a our first part located in the center of this road reserve. Next, I'll create a new part. And now I'm going to do one for this trailing um, the end of the alignment, and it's, it's a straight segment there. I'll use the other option here, which is point and direction. <clears throat> so there's a few fields to fill in here. One is a point. I'm going to use the corner of this boundary as my reference point. That's fairly straightforward. And the direction, I want to use it, keep it parallel to the boundary. By picking on here, the measures, at point, bearing. And so again, this needs to be picked with direction. So pick, drag, release, pick the segment of the, the um, boundary I want to be, and go accept, middle mouse button to accept. And there's the bearing of that, that boundary. So relative start, relative end. So at the moment, I've only got one point being here. So relative to that point, I want to go back. So I want to go minus 20 metres. And I want to go forward 50 metres from that point at that bearing. Now we know that this is a 20 metre road reserve for the first part anyway. So we want to offset this to the right. So that'll be a 10. Go set, and so now we've located the second part of this alignment. So I've noticed oh, I've, I haven't gone far enough here. I want to go another, say, 20 metres. I'll go plus 20, press enter, and then it, it auto calculates it to be 70. Go set, and it's updated. That was just a simple little, little edit, but sometimes can be more difficult when you've got the IP method. All right, so now what's left to do is to put in here 
a, um, a radius. I don't know what the radius is. And because I've got currently two fixed segments, the rules of the element method is I need to have a free element between the two. So picking the first fixed element, I'll insert a new one between them. And so I want to do an arc and it needs to be a free arc. So there's different um, options here. The one I'll go with is, as I don't know the radius, is I'll go through a point. So the point that I want to use will be somewhere in the middle of this road reserve. One way to do this is pick the point. So it's asking for an XY. I can then go into my CAD snaps point and go down to one that's called snaps midpoint. So there's many options there. So it's asking for the first point. And I'm going to put a known point on this um, top boundary. And I'm going to use this string here because that's a definite point. So now when I move my mouse around, you can see that it's got a little snap point that's halfway between wherever I am. I'm now going to select the second position. I'm going to go into another command called perpendicular. It's asking for a string. This is the string I want to be perpendicular to. The point I want to be perpendicular to is the same point I had to start with. I'll pick that one, go accept, and it's now punched in a value which is the center of this road reserve. When I go set, it's now put a, a curve in here and it's made the radius to be 100, which is a good value. So there, there it is now in alignment going through the center of that road reserve. So that was just a few, um, few options when creating geometry in 12D, how it's done. All right, so we'll move on now and we'll do some, um, look at some design that's already started and we need to do some um, modifications to the design. So cross sections um, is a good way of looking at your design. I'll position this one up in the top right. And um, cross sections, it's also good to use profile model on section. There's various options here, but the model strings is very handy for design work like this. So yeah, I'll pick a string, zoom in down in here and pick one of the cross section strings. So what we can do here is go into our properties and get our view set up so that we can use it. As with the long section view, we'll turn the grid on. So we'll draw it first on the view. That way any other data can be on top of it. Uh, what we also want to show is the annotations. We want to show you what the grades are. So now we can see what the grades of each segment of the, the profiled string. Another thing that is handy is the profile extents. So currently we've got nothing added to this view. If we add in the tin, I'll just type T on, on the plus. Type tin and that just gives us all the, the tin models that are there. I'll add in the survey. And there we can see what the survey looks like at that cross section. So back to the settings, I'll make it just one meter. And what that does is extend out the, the view of whatever models are added to that view. Press enter and uh, we're done there. So now when we go through next and previous, we can see where we are. So the benefits of this panel here is that it highlights, you can turn it off but you don't know where you are. If it's on, you can see in plan whereabouts you are talking about when you're viewing. The fit view is handy when you're, say, you just want to have a look at the left-hand side and when you go next and previous, it maintains the grid position and also um, just looks at the left-hand side. 
when fit views on just means that you're looking at the whole profiled string centered in the view the last one is the auto pan which can be very handy for when you're tracking along your job you zoomed in nice and tight so you can see all your data when the section goes off the view it automatically centers the view um, the, the, the data into the center of your view so you can always keep a track of where you are the last option on here or tick box is the uh, dynamic profile and so whenever you move in plan it just snaps to the closest string and profiles that one so it's a quick way just to have a look around by the using your mouse The um, change item is, is handy also when you want to jump to a certain location. So if I wanted to go to change 250 and press enter, it just jumps to that cross section. So that's a handy tool, very useful when, when designing jobs and particularly when they're long and they're too, become too small when they're zoomed out to the full extent of the design. You can zoom right in and then track your, your job along as you, you move through your cross sections. We'll profile the alignment in here. So making sure that I've got the, oh, the super alignment. This is what the, uh, the alignment looks like. So we can be looking at the data in a long section, in a cross section, in plan and also in a perspective view. If we add into here using some uh, view favorites, the parking. So it adds in all my data and sets up the view how I'd like it to be displayed. All right, so the, the job we want to do here is we want to uh, do some widening for parking along this section of the road. And we also want to tidy up the intersection over here. So for the first first part of this is putting in some widening for parking. Got an image here just to sort of show what we're doing. So it's one of the basic modifiers is to modify the width. We're going to modify it from the existing 3.5 metre wide lane to a six metre wide lane. So the, the modifier link is the, 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 um, the modifier that we're going to use and we're going to change the width but maintain the crossfall. So the 3% crossfall will keep on going but we just change the width. So that's nice and handy for the, the, um, the main full width. But when we want to ta taper between the existing width to the new width, there's a, a variation to this same modifier link where we can use the type position position. The position position is using the width of that link at the first change and the width of the link at this end change and then transitioning it from one to the other. This saves having to type in 3.5 here and 6.5 zero at the at the end change. So the, the less input that you have in your design, the less times you have to go and update things when things change. So let's jump into our design and have a go at this. So we're using the recalc menu, edit data, I'm going to go and grab this design. I don't even have to know what, what it's called, I can just jump straight to it. And we're going to have a look at the information on the left hand side. So I'll bring up my uh, modifiers left. So these days everything is generally in the modifiers left and right. There's still the old boxing method here. The recalc, recalc auto, more if you wanted to go back to using the old tile templates. They can also be used in the modifiers left and right. Okay, so looking at our first command, we're going to work on this area here. So 
So our first command we're going to do, so it's a modify link. So we're modifying our curb lip and we're going to modify its width and hold the cross fall. The type is just going to be width through, through the whole change range. We're just going to make it six meters wide. And I've uh, set up here an, an alias for the parking. So we're just going to go from the start to the end of the parking change range. It's always good to use change, um, smart changes. I'll tick on active and go apply. And so there's a straightforward, just to modify the width. If we get our cross section to go to that spot, we can see now that we've got a six metre spot there, but we've kept that 3% cross fall. The next modifier is going to do that taper at the start of the, the parking bay. And we're using the position position still keeping the width, uh, modifying the width and, and keeping the cross fall. So this time we're going to use those same um, aliases, but they're both going to be based on the start, the first one being 15 metres before the start of the parking. So it's going to take the width at 15 metres before, which is the 3.5, and it's going to transition to the ending width, which is the width of 6 metres make that one active and apply and you can see now that we've got the taper there. If I were to reverse these two modifiers and move the taper to before the six meter wide modifier and go apply, you can see that the taper is no longer there and that's because it's relying on what the width is at the end change but we haven't modified the width at the end change until afterwards. So I'll put that back in the right order. So we're doing the, the full widening first and then we're coming back and doing the tapers. Go apply and now the tapers will work. The next one is going to be the final taper. So everything's the same but now we're using the relative alias end for the parking and we're going to go 15 metres past the end of it for the uh, extension. Turn that on and go apply and there's our, our uh, widening for the, the parking. And that's all updated now in there. And so what's, what's happened, because we've got the auto pan on, it has repositioned the the um, perspective view. If you want to go back to where we were, we can use our save position, and there we are back to where we were again. Okay, going back to our design. There is one more thing we we need to do here, and that is the road reserve boundary is still 20 metres but we've made the road wider. So what we need to do is get the the width of one of these links reduced so as to fit within the road reserve. We'll do this over in the perspective view. Alright so here is our modifier. So we're going to move modify the footpath front string. So that's the, uh, just press F2 and pick on here. We're going to modify the, the um, footpath left string. It's the front of the footpath. The base link is going to be the hinge. So the hinge is the, the, um, the keyword that we use in capitals for the centre of the road. And so this is an absolute modifier meaning that we want to be absolute from a reference or base link called the hinge. We're going to modify the width and hold the cross fall. So that footpath cross fall, which we can see on our cross section is 2%. We're going to maintain that, but we're going to reduce the width. Now the width is 7. So where does that value come from? So under 
utilities measure value. Alright, so we're going to go point to point length. So we'll just pick on here the center line. I'll turn off my line snap. The default hotkey for that is F4 and you see up the top there going on and off. So now it's off. So when I pick now it's just going to snap to the point and not pick the line. So that's <clears throat> the first point and now I want to go to where that string is and pick the footpath string and go accept. And so that's seven meters. So what I'm saying is I'm going to make this string be seven meters all the way along from the control line. Even though the links in between it change their width, this one's always going to be absolutely seven meters from the control line. So I'll turn that on and go uh, apply. And so now you can see that that is now updated in our section view. We've now only got a, uh, a small section of grass from the back of curb to the footpath. All right, we'll just have a quick drive down to see what this is looking like. So most panels can be saved off and restored later using the um, layouts. So I've done one here for a string drive where so I filled out all the details that I want and so drive. And so we're just going to go down at 40 k's an hour and just have a look at this, this design. See that the, the widening has happened. So uh, now we're coming up to the intersection. So uh, the intersection is not right at the moment. We've got our through road going with footpath and batters all through the intersection. So this is something that we need to, to tidy up. So we'll minimise that part of the, the modifiers and we'll go and have a look at the um, <clears throat> this modifier here. So there's only fixed from name is this modifier, which means that from the link that we name, which is the curb lip, so from our curb lip string, we're going to remove everything outside of that. So it's going to be outside, yes. So our chainage range, we're going to use the smart chainages and use our um, alignment strings for the curb returns. So that way if the curb returns move for, you know, as the design progresses, all this will update to suit wherever those curb returns are. There are lots of um, smart change options here. The standard one that we always see is start of reference string, end of reference string, but there's also start of other string and end of other string. So sometimes you don't know which way a string starts and stops. So to have something that's um, simpler, we can use the highest drop chainage or the lowest drop chainage of the other string. So that way we're using the chainages, the lowest chainage of our design, and wherever that string is the lowest chainage. So there's many more in here that you can have a look at. So we're doing the lowest chainage of the other string and the other string being curb return CO1 and then the highest chainage. So we start off the lowest chainage here and then the highest chainage here of the curb return CO2 string. So when I turn that on and go apply, it all updates and now all the design underneath is seen. If we have a look at our Section view, let's see a chainage, probably something like 160. We can see now that we're only got the string going out for the pavement. All right, that's all I'm going to have a look at at the moment for the um, the simple modifiers and um, 
uh, just a few of the ways 12D works. So now I'm going to just show a few things um, to do with um, startup problems and where to find more information. So resolving 12D model startup problems. 12D model has some extra requirements that some other software may not have. So you've got the software install. It also needs to have the dongle driver installed. There's a dongle itself, which is USB, a physical piece of hardware that's plugged into the computer, and the nodes file. The nodes file tells 12D what options that you have um, you have purchased. So there's there's all these areas where things might not be working, and to help us solve that, there's the authorization error panel. So here is the authorization error panel. It has all the information available so as to work out where the problem is. This one has a status no servers found. It is doing an auto find for a Weeboo network dongle, but did not find one. So there's a what to try next part. The first item is nodes file contains. Note that where the file nodes file is found will show on the top half of the panel or say that it is not found. The next one down, check your authorization details tab. I'll show that next. What to try next changes depending on what problems have been encountered. If this panel is not helping you determine the issue, there is an email support button. This works with the default email system. If your email is not set, you will need to use the save to file. Note that, note that the message area, which is just above the, the buttons, you will need to wait until MS Info 32 XE has finished creating the file for emailing. The authorization details tab has all the details about how 12D model is set up. There's the product information, the nodes file, what configuration was used, the dongles, and the EMV file, Windows environments and output window. The output window has lots of information about how 12D is working and where things are found. There's also the Windows, Windows details about what drivers and versions are installed for the dongles. Note that the message area has changed to say that the system information is available. Now the email support and save to file buttons can be pressed. So where to get some information? So the um, search bar is one area that um, I showed earlier, but there's also the help reference. It's a good starting point. 12D uses the Windows default PDF viewer for context sensitive help. This can be changed to use the alternative PDF viewer if required. The 12D model forum is a good place to start to search and ask questions. There's a big pool of people looking at, at that area and um, often a answer can be asked fairly quickly. The 12D model website has um, 12D model updates, webinars, videos, um, and documentation. So I'll just jump over to um, show a little bit about the 12D website. So here's the, the 12D website, so www.12d.com, as well as across the top with all the menus. Down the bottom, there's some menus as well, but there's the, the links on the, the main homepage here from um, the technical forum, the conference in the middle of the year, um, overviews, webinars, product updates, and the forum links. So if we click on the product updates and go to version 12, C1K, so now we've got it all in the one done download. So the, the download is for a PDF with all the install notes. 
So this is the one-stop shop now. It has everything in it. It's got all the details about how to install 12D, what's what's needed there, the um, all right, the um, installing the code meter, um, where to get the drivers from, where to download 12D version from, both the 64-bit and the 32-bit versions. Uh, putting the nodes file in, but it also has some documentation, the reference manual and the getting started for designers and surveyors. So there's a link there to download the PDF. So for, for all the basics to do with design or survey, this has lots of information about how to use your views and um, how to use lots of you know the basics of using 12D. There's um, a vast amount of information to do with that there. So it's a good starting point. Um, I've I've covered a few of the things covered there. All right. So um, back to you, Lisa. Thanks, Graham. I am. Um, I think we're a bit close to time to do any live question time today. So um, we'll get. I'll get you to get back to our. Um, attendees by email for those who've asked questions so thank you to all. We've got some great training courses coming up in person in Brisbane, Melbourne and Perth. Uh, the handout available on this webinar outlines what's in some of these and you can register through the training page of our website or contact us by email for more information. And don't forget to register for our 12D technical forum this July. It's getting closer. We're also running our Innovation Awards again this year, so get your thinking caps on because the end of April is fast approaching. The recording of today's webinar will be available in coming days through our website and our YouTube channel. Our next two training webinars are Recording Chains for Surveyors on the 22nd of March and Batter Slope Tadpoles on the 28th of March. So feel free to sign up for those through our website as well as for our great upcoming industry solutions topics. We'll keep you posted on those and more through email and social media if you're subscribed. If you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you at future webinars.